What is up, everybody? Welcome to episode 100 of Into the Necrosphere. And by now, you will know that on this installment of the show, I'm going to be talking to Christian Gall Espidol, uh, easily one of the most recognizable and uh, some would say notorious characters on the black metal scene. Uh, he has been a vocalist for Gorgoroth, Treldom, uh, most recently Gallsveard, uh, amongst a host of endeavors um, and, and a very unique character and somebody that I was absolutely delighted to have on my show. Uh, we covered a host of topics, including uh, some of the projects that he currently has in the offing. Uh, we also spoke about black metal, about Goldsbeard. Uh, we spoke about what really happened during that infamous uh, interview with Vice Magazine back in 2010. Um, and we also spoke about wine, although I will give you a spoiler right from the off. Uh, we did not, uh, or I, di I did not manage to convince him to uh, take a sip of wine and go Satan afterwards. But uh, a really great guy, perhaps not as chatty as some of the guests that I've had on my podcast, but. Um, I think that uh, as the conversation progressed and he started to loosen up a little bit more, uh, you know, we kind of got to a natural rhythm, uh, you know, and frankly, I think the fact that he's such a, uh, a private and elusive guy um, and, and somebody who so clearly marches to the beat of his own drum uh, is probably the reason why his music is so appealing and why him as a, as a character is so interesting. But I uh, really, really enjoyed speaking to him. I thoroughly hope you guys are going to enjoy this conversation as well. It could not have happened without the uh, tireless efforts of Katie Irizarry of Season of Mist Records. So shout out to her. Shout out also to my brother Kelly Schaefer of uh, Atheist. I mentioned last week that um, the original plans for episode 100 fell through. So I had to do some uh, some pivoting very quickly, put out the bat signal, and uh, Katie and Kelly responded in fine style. And if you stick around until uh, later on in the episode, not only will you be treated to a extended news rant featuring uh, my friend Evan of Quell, uh, but you will also get to find out who my guest is for episode 101. That was actually off the back of a conversation that, uh, or an introduction that was facilitated by Kelly. Um, and uh, whereas Gall might not be the chattiest Kathy around. Uh, the guest for episode 101 definitely was not short of words. Uh, that was easily one of my favorite episodes I've recorded ever, uh, and I'm really excited about sharing it with you. But I do want to say a very heartfelt thanks to all of the guests that have been on this show over the course of 100 episodes, uh, particularly those folks who uh, you know I've, I've grown to become friends with over the, uh, the, the course of the last two and a bit years. Um, you know, really, when I started this podcast, I, I don't think that I ever imagined that it would get to the point that it's gotten to right now. And, you know, the folks that I have had the opportunity to speak to and the folks that I've become friends with, it has been a true honor and a privilege. Um, you know, and I could list the names of here, but I, I'd be scared to leave anybody out. But uh, you all know who you are, and, and I really thank you for your time. Thank you for giving me the content to, uh, to create a podcast like this. Uh, and thank you for being willing guests in, uh, you know, what I'm sure when I kind of pitched it to you as Joe Rogan for Metal People initially, to some of you might have sounded a bit weird. I also want to say thank you very much to uh, everybody who has supported the show. Whether you've been around since episode one, uh, you know, whether you are one of the folks that have sent me a message recently to say you discovered me through the Ruins of Beverest interview or the, um, I'm trying to think, the Alan Averill interview, uh, you know, or however you found the show and, you know, you're, you're now digging into the archives. I, I hope you know how much I am humbled by and how much I appreciate the kind words. And I hope you also know, and I'll state this for the record right now, this podcast is always going to be about the scene, about giving back to the scene that I love so much. I'm never going to have sponsors. There's never going to be any stupid ad reads in the show. Uh, I do this for myself, and I do this for all of you. So I hope that I can continue doing it, um, and I hope that uh, I can continue to uh, you know get on great guests and hopefully along the way break a couple of bands who are very deserving of some exposure but um yeah as i said there will be no uh, corporate shenanigans on this podcast this is uh by metal people for or by metal man for metal people um so on that note i'm going to forego any of the usual announcements you already know what it is um and i'm going to welcome to the podcast for the first time ever gall Um, so how's everything been going with you over the course of the, the past 18 months? Um, I know you live pretty rural the same way that I do. 
So uh, you you sort of probably didn't get to experience any of the the hassles of the pandemic and and, and probably enjoyed the isolation a little bit as well. Well, it's um, it, it's been uh, decent for me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so, I mean, in 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 the time that you know things were locked down, I guess first question is how how strict how you know how stringent were the lockdowns uh, where you were because you live in a small village, correct? Uh, yes, but also uh, also run a gallery in uh, in Bergen. So, uh, but it's still been fairly fairly open. So the gallery didn't have to shut down or anything like that during the. Um, um, first, uh, uh, just in minor periods, uh, so probably a total of fourteen days or so. Sorry, bear with me one second. I just have to quiet the dog. I don't know why she suddenly chose her now to start barking. Hold on for two seconds. Right. So basically, has two modes: either lovable angel or DefCon one. So, so it's. Every so often when I, because I, I work from home, so every so often when I have to, uh, when I'm on a call or something, she'll choose the worst time to uh, decide that now is the time to try and get rid of the postman <laughs> or, or something like that. But uh, sorry, yeah, we were, so we were talking about the, the, the gallery, so that didn't really sort of affect anything, uh, the lockdowns, anything like that. Uh, and I guess it gave you a bit more creative time as well? Uh, mm, well... I um, I'm a bit uncertain how any of it. The first year were uh, very dead creatively, uh, uh, but uh, this year I've been uh, very uh, loosened up quite a lot. So I've uh, already recorded uh, three albums within this year, and uh, I'm prepared for. Uh, Two more to get started uh, within the end of twenty one. And are you able to elaborate on what those those projects are? I would assume one of them is the the Galsvird, um, uh, EP, correct? Yes. And then I, will, uh, I have a nameless project going on with uh, the ex guitarist in Tadon. It's not metal at all. So, and uh, I brought with me Lindy Fajella. As um, uh, she's doing uh, vocals with me. So, and of course, her pro- uh, project I uh, have done quite a bit on that uh, release. Uh, I think her album will be released uh, the twenty sixth of November, if my memory is correct. And yeah. I've uh, started to dive into some of my older bands. So, um, yeah, next year will be more revealing. Mm -hmm. And would that potentially, and I asked this because I was a massive fan of of Trelden, but particularly Tilmina, um, would that include possibly resurrecting Trelden as as an entity or, or the project that you mentioned earlier with the uh, with the former guitarist of Problem is that kind of how I guess you would continue that that line of or that line of creativity or that line of of, uh, of music um, I can reveal that um, Trelldom is uh, is still active yeah yeah so uh, but uh, yeah with um, um, with with the member in the band that uh, have uh, been with me for the longest, yeah. So, uh, but he's uh, taking taking charge with uh, more than one instrument, basically. Yeah, yeah. Trail them to me. I think part of what, what I love so much about Galsvert is, you know, and and I and I'm still struggling sometimes when I listen to the particularly when I listen to Tillman and I listen to Ghosts Invited back to back. I still struggle to put my finger on quite what it is, but they f- it feels to me like there's a a spiritual connection to the two, you know, in in terms of the attitude, in terms of the atmosphere that they that they evoke. But um, with with Galsvert, I think it kind of takes a lot of what I loved about uh, Tillmina and Traldom to to sort of the next level. 
you know, it feels to me like, you know, as far as music that you've that you've made, and I've generally been interested in almost everything that you've done, but this to me really feels like the most confident, um, but also the most really sort of intensely personal that you've, you know, music that you've ever created. And I feel like, uh, you know, as far as the new EP is concerned, all I've heard so far is the Humming Mountain, but I kind of feel like it takes that platform that you laid with with Ghosts Invited really to the the, the next level. Um, and, I, and I guess the first question that, that springs to mind for me is when you when you think of your experience in in uh, Goldsberg to, to date, how is it different? Well, you know what what's what's different about this band and being in this band and creating in this band than what what has come before? Uh, let's see. I um, a lot of it comes down to um, uh, my uh, collaboration and my work with. Uh, with uh, Russ Kilman, the guitarist. Uh, he's very, uh, uh, he's very patient and uh, undisturbing in the process. So, yeah, and, and we're very, we work very freely on each other. Uh, mm. So, um, that has uh, a major, importance uh, for this that it uh, yeah it, it's allowed to take it, the forms without having to <laughs> over explain them so it's it's a very um it, he he allows me to work in a very isolated state uh, without being interrupted continuously with uh, how far is the production? How far is this? Mm. I, I, for me, that's uh, um, yeah important uh, that, uh, that we have uh, that kind of dialogue. It's interesting too. You you know when you mentioned that, I, I remember listening to your uh, your conversation with uh, Thomas on his uh, on his podcast, and you know it does sound you know as you have explained, you take your time when it comes to creating, but there's there's also something that as much as Goldsberg is much more complex than and than Gorgoroth, for example, there's also something that feels quite spontaneous uh, about that. Uh, you know, which again begs the question in my mind: How are you able to capture that spontaneity the way that you have done? Particularly when you 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 know you do kind of take your time when it comes to music. Is it a, is it a case of experimenting with different ideas and then suddenly kind of finding the one that you know works? Um, or is it refining an idea over a period of time? Mm. Um, I, I think it might be a combination of... Um, uh, I, I need to... I, I never write things down, so I always work with uh, things in the back of my head. Uh, so it's allowed for the sponta uh, spontaneous uh, response uh, even though, uh, it, even though there's a certain part that is carved out, but within uh, within uh, this this part, you're allowed. I allow myself to throw in these spontaneous responses that I basically uh, were unaware existed there, but I, that I managed to overlap. Mm. And yeah, so it's, uh, so it is, a, it is a combination. It's almost kind of experiencing, I guess, the, the music or, or the, the idea coming to life within the moment and then adding in whatever that sort of additional inspiration is that you get at the time. Yeah. So sometimes you uh, recognize that the idea is not, Telling the, uh, the story broad enough, <laughs> so you, you kind of had have, have to uh, advance it. Enough. Yeah, I was blown away by the way when when I heard you talk about the fact that you don't write lyrics down. Everything is in is in your mind because I don't think people realize if they listen to you know even just what I do one year when I record the intros, the outros, and all of that sort of stuff. It, when you kind of almost, I guess, not looking at your reflection in the mirror, but you've got the microphone in front of you and nothing else and you're just talking. 
I don't think people realize how easy it is for your mind to go into all sorts of different directions and, and come off track. Out of curiosity, how many takes would you do on average, you know, in the studio if you were to do a piece of vocals or is it again, is it something that just you've got it in the back of your mind and you just do it? Um, like the, the humming mountain, it's, uh, that's the first take. And uh, then I've just added uh, on the on the third part. I've added uh, the uh, second line, but uh, but otherwise it's just the first take. And Evel, the engineer, he uh, he didn't allow me to do another uh, take. Basically, was, did you say nailed it? <laughs> we, yeah. we don't we don't need to do another one. So that's basically just the first take. Yeah. Yeah. How do you feel about the the response that that Ghost Invited received? Because I think you you guys won the Spiegelman Award. Um, I, I remember when the record first came out. You know, people were were almost a bit taken aback by the fact that I I don't, I don't know whether they were expecting Gorgoroth Part Two or, or God Seed Part Two, but they were taken aback a, a by how how different it was. Um, and a lot of people said it's not black metal. I, I personally, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on this too. I personally do feel like it's a black metal record. I think it's you, you managed to create a black metal record in spirit more than a lot of you know black metal bands that will use all of the mainstays of you know black metal like the screaming and things like that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know how you you know how you've uh, how you've perceived people's. Um, response to the uh, to the to the album and and whether anything about it has surprised you. Mm. Well, it, it's a long time since we did that album, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I, I never, uh, I've, I kind of don't think genres when I I do anything. In that sense, it's uh, it's first and for foremost. Uh, just emotion and music, but by all means, I can uh, uh, it con uh, concept wise and energy wise, I, there's def definitely things that for me is what I use to capitalize as black metal. But I, hmm. uh, I don't know if that genre exists, and I think it might be something in the past. So I have a theory about that too, actually. A couple of months ago, uh, I was doing an episode of Mike Hill uh, of Tombs' uh, podcast, and we were he had a uh, what is one of the themes he would have on his show is discussing classic records. We were talking about Ad Majorum, um, and while I was busy having a conversation with him, I, a thought popped into my head. It, it was an older interview that I've seen or that I'd seen with you where they were talking to you about black metal and you kind of said that part of what black metal represents to you is freedom. And in that, you know, as, as I was thinking about that, I kind of felt like that in many ways is sort of where I think philosophically a lot of black metal in 2021 has gone. Um, you know, I, I, I feel like, especially if I listen to bands like Aversio Humanitatis, Selbst, um, Eccles, bands like that, They've taken the genre. They've they've applied that that philosophy to it and sort of taken it into these different extreme, but but still, in my view, very very interesting directions. But as somebody who's you know been active in the genre for as long as you have, what what do you you know how do you perceive the genre at the moment? Do you think that the fact that it has you know maybe become a little bit more accepted, um, you know, generally speaking, takes away from its allure or from its danger? What, what's your take of, of the on, on the state of black metal right now? Um, I'm absolutely the wrong person to <laughs> to uh, ask this question because I I pay no attention to uh, to it, it at all. It's uh, the the only times when I uh, uh, interact with it is uh, when I'm doing interviews or. When I uh, when I'm touring, but mm. uh, uh, yeah, it's it, it's um, for me it's a very distant uh, distant world. Um, I I think it's probably different from country to country as well. How um, like in Norway, this is a fairly nor normal phenomenon at the moment. So, yeah, it's 
it, it's a different world. Yeah. I, I, I think there's a lot of romanticizing about Norway just generally. And I and I laughed when you and Thomas spoke about the the black packers that I sure would, you know, be coming to your gallery a lot and things like that. But one thing you said that was interesting was the, you know, even though you you grew up in a relatively uh, rural community, the access to metal when you were when you were young was, you know, really quite significant. I, I came from South Africa, so you know, when I was there, you know, it, it really was a you know a treasure hunt to to try and find everything as like you know Indiana Jones raiding the uh, the, the lost Pharaoh's tomb to try and find the music that you wanted. Why? I mean, I guess why has or why is heavy metal popular in Norway, or is it is it popular? I guess I, I'm I'm curious to kind of understand the dynamic or, or how the how the 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 sort of wider genre I guess fits into the the, the country's cultural or fits into I guess people's general tastes. Oh uh, well, again, uh, I don't. I usually don't ask people what kind of music they listen to, but <laughs> but then, uh, but uh, yeah, I think metal in it has always had an important part in in Norway. I think even more in the rural areas rather than uh, city life because there's more noise. They're already so you don't you don't need to invite noise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If it makes any sense. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. No, so, but again, it it, it seems to be uh, yeah in the same state as it always had been in the sense of how accessible and approachable this was. For people, but um, again, I'm. It's uh, I'm uh, I'm rarely uh, talking about music when I meet people. Yeah, yeah. So if we go back to uh, Goldsberg, uh, you know, I mentioned that the record feels you know more personal, more more reflective. All the music I've heard Goldsberg do so far, you know, certainly a step away from the. The the you know the, the sort of anger and the 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 sense of the feeling that I got listening to Admiorum, which I you know I still love to this day. But I, I guess that change of 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 pace or that shift in in, in attitude, do you feel like that's a reflective of of you know ch- changes that have come to you with age? I mean, I'm 41 now, and I've spoken on the podcast about this before. I do realize, especially in the last two three years, as you get older, particularly when you cross 40, how differently you start viewing the world, you start thinking about life in quite a different way. Is is that, has that been the same for you? Mm, I would have to be in your head if I could answer that. It's, uh, <laughs> no, it's, um, I basically just work in the moment. It's, yeah. uh, and there's, um, With, with Gods, I've uh, also brought with me songs that I, that I made when I were 16, 17 years old, basically. So it's, and I, I still feel that they fit into that. There is a there is a connection to, to mm. it. So I, um, so I, I actually don't know. Uh, uh, but of course, there is... Uh, There's layers of understanding of uh, your capability, and of course the security of, but maybe also the lack of aggression. As uh, um, you, you stop shouting. <laughs> so. Yeah, that, that was. I, I think that's probably the thing that surprised me most. I, I don't know why I was expecting it to be that, but when I when I listened to Goldsberg, hearing you do you know, clean singing or a variation of a, of a cleaner vocal on every song. You know, I, I have always been a fan of the, of the screams. Um, you know, I think the, I think especially Till Minna and Admiorum, I think are some of the most powerful black metal vocals I've heard, but I really, I, I feel like the, the aggression of the screams gave way to a really sort of real passion in your, in your clean singing voice as well. Um, and and that is if 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 I, unless I'm very mistaken, that's the first time you've recorded a, a record where you've put out music where 
clean singing is is so prominent? Well, um, of course, um, there's quite a bit of it in, uh, in the trend on releases, it's even though they've been more, um, they have been distasteful clean singing, you know, with, uh, maybe more, uh, more daring and. Uh, um, but it, it, it's kind of a method acting in, in, to explain the emotion that you are. So it's <clears throat> while uh, while this is yeah more clean in uh, it it represents different entities and, or characters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to the the Gorgoroth days, um, you know, I, I don't want to talk about the the uh, you know any of the name malarkey, but I, what I was keen to know is, are you and and King still in touch? And and you know, do you see a, a possibility of, of collaboration there in the future? It's um, it's been a while since um, last time I saw him. Uh, he's. Um, when he contacts me, it's usually to try me, uh, try to get me to do some sort of collaboration. So um, at the moment, I'm uh, preoccupied with other things. And, uh, so we'll see. And I would, I would imagine also in amidst the, all the music and stuff that you're doing, obviously there's your art and there's the gallery as well. Um, how how busy does that side of your life keep you uh, in you know relative to to music? Uh, well, um, it's it's fairly busy, and uh, usually, yeah, there's always a interruption in the communication with other with exhibits and other things. So it's uh, and also the dealing with humans constantly but uh, there's also a plus side to it this the studio where i record is basically just 10 minutes walk from where i have the gallery so so it's um it, uh, yeah it, it's an excuse to run over and record something mm -hmm. so it's uh, this year it's definitely uh, be be more. Uh, I, I, I tour. It, it would be uh, disturbing for that process, but it, 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 for me, it shows that I, it, you know, in a way, it uh, helps me get the distance to what I'm working musically. Mm -hmm. uh, so instead of escaping the world and uh, reinventing my energy, it's. Uh, I get a distance enough with uh, with the gallery, so, like the whole just the ghost and white album. I were basically uh, running back and forth from from the gallery in the studio. So yeah, uh, long days, but still a creative outlet. When it comes to the, the the painting, you you still don't sell any of your uh, paintings, do you? Uh, well, uh, hopefully not. But uh, there's people now and again that are, are asking for them. So I I, I rewatched the and yeah. I I want to talk a little bit about this if you don't mind. But I I rewatched the the Vice True Norwegian Black Metal documentary and one I found it hysterical when you said that. Um, you know, people wanted to buy your painting, so you just made the price ins insanely high and they were still willing to do it. But uh, just with regards to that documentary, as I rewatched it recently, I didn't enjoy it. I didn't like it when it came out, but I was amazed in hindsight by how tacky the whole thing was. You know, it, it felt very obnoxious to me. And I, I feel like, you know, the way that they framed it, you know, they 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 kind of frame it before they meet you, like, you know, it's a scene out of the Blair Witch or like they're about to meet Charles Manson. It was extremely sensationalist, um, but I, I was curious to know how different was the the experience of of actually filming that and being with the the, the people who were making the documentary to the end product as they as they released it. 
Oh, well, I've uh, never paid attention to the release itself. I, uh, I, I just were asked by Peter Best to uh, double check on a few points. Uh, so I've not watched it myself. Uh, just, just a few sequences were, uh, where I had to see if they had done it, uh, quoted me correctly. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, but I think they uh, hung around me for five days, days or so, when I, when I had, had just been released from uh, prison. So I, I were not the most, uh, <laughs> I, I were not uh, very prepared for being social. Mm -hmm. But by all means, good, uh, good guys, uh, good impression by them. So. What uh, one of the very famous scenes is obviously you taking them up the mountain and uh, and them having a uh, a tough time uh, getting you know I guess trudging through the snow and dealing with a cold. Was that what made you decide to do that? What what made you decide to take them up the mountain? Well, well me and Peter had been there uh, prior. Don't know, but then uh, during. Uh, um, late summer, uh, we, we did a photo shoot there, so we uh, we, uh, we wanted to revisit it. So uh, I, th I think this uh, true Norwegian black metal uh, it was kind of a Peter Best thing. Mm -hmm. uh, originally, it was meant to be a, a documentary that were surfacing around black metal in general. And then it turned into just uh, focus on on me basically. Uh, so um, yeah, so it, it was uh, it was mainly just to show Peter Best and let him do a couple of winter shots there as well. And uh, of course, at the, uh, this is done I think in February. So. We basically have uh, four hours of light, so uh, if you if you want to if you want to take a walk, you really need to <laughs> to uh, keep up the pace. And it's uh, yeah, you don't want to get lost there after yeah. the dark. So. And I was about saying that's a pretty steep mountain as well. I mean, we've got some hills and things like that. Yeah, that I I climb I climbed out, particularly during lockdowns, so I can stay fit and things like that. Um, and uh, if you're not used to that, it it it's amazing how quickly you get tired. You get to about halfway up the first one, and you, you you're huffing like somebody who's smoking thirty cigarettes a day. Yeah. The the. The end of the documentary, and this will be the last question I ask about that. But uh, again, I, I, I ask it out of curiosity as much as, ever, uh, as as anything. At the end of the documentary, you you very kind of famously cut off the the guy and tell him he's not asking the right questions, and you just stare until they they cut the camera. Part of it, I, I the the interview is telling you guide me after you've been after you've spent all of the conversation with him, telling him how you know what the. I guess your philosophy is around leaders, followers, etc. That kind of suggested to me that by that point you were pretty irritated. But but what made you decide? Okay, in, in, enough's enough. And when the cameras went off, was there any conversation subsequent to that? Uh, well, it, it was. We're basically the last take, uh, and I had uh, chased everyone apart from uh, Peter down into my, into the barn. <laughs> So, uh, because they were so uh, annoyed, mm -hmm. and uh, Peter knew me from before, so uh, it's, it's the camera is just running on a type of tripod, and uh, so Peter is the one asking. Uh, but um, I'm as grumpy as I as I look in that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and 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 I guess he he knew it for sure after the uh, after the interview as well. Yeah, P P Peter has known me for yeah. years, basically. So, it's so, so let me ask you this question. You know, as as time has progressed, I, I feel like the 
the perception of you in the in public has changed quite a lot. And you probably, alongside maybe somebody like um, uh, Attila from Mayhem, you know, you're 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 one of the most prolific figures in in black metal. How do you deal with that increased level of attention? Um, you know, and almost, if you will, celebrity. Although I, I use that word hesitantly. But to have gone from the way they described you in the in the Vice documentary, the most hated man in Norway, to you know winning awards, and I and I guess being seen more of a, as more of a maverick, a, a trailblazer, and a pioneer, which in my view, you, you know, you you most definitely are. Uh, well, I'm I'm just me. I don't uh, I don't pay too much attention to to everything around. I, uh, I, my life is like this. <laughs> there's something that's uh, not, uh, there's there's too many uh, um, things to uh, that you would have been annoyed mm-hmm. if you paid attention to it. So it's yeah, we do our thing. Are you surprised by how many people would come up to you as if you're on tour, for example, and then say what a you know big impact that you had in their life? And you know, I, I guess you know when you came out as well. I know for a lot of folks, you know, who had been wrestling with that in their personal lives and and you know not had the courage to do it themselves, that would have certainly been a, a big inspiration. Um, well. Um. I don't know. Like, I'm not giving too much too much thought to it. That's uh, again kind of it, it's just something that uh, kind of happens. It, uh, it, it were made way more out of it than it actually were. Mm. Uh, it's um, it, it were not it, just that the media hadn't thrown any attention to it, it weren't, it wasn't something that were a secret basically. So hmm. it was just that when media first uh, dared to ask if, is it okay if I ask about this? We, well, it was um, uh, guts from uh, rock art in Germany that, uh, That were, and uh, of course, I said, "Yeah, by, by all means." But uh, prior to that, no one, no one had been to to ask. So I think that's. I didn't think too much. About it. Yeah. I, I would definitely say for, for you know this is a compliment from me to you personally as well. I, I think there's a subset of people that are are into the scene that, and I, Mike and I have spoken about this also. We're into the scene that don't necessarily feel like they want to belong to any sort of conformist community. You know, we don't want to be the people that do exactly the same thing that shows that, that everybody does or wear the same clothes or have the same outlook on life. And I think to have a figure like you in the scene is very inspirational because it, it I, you know, I know people that are, you know, uh, dedicated black metal fans who, you know, in their, per- you would never, never know it from seeing them. And that in, in a way to me is, is, kind of the right thing you know this should be something for the you know that is purely for the individual and is about individual empowerment that's always how i've seen it um that's always as that's why i love it so much um but again i I say that purely just as a a compliment to you i think that seeing somebody i guess truly live those values is probably the best way i can describe it i i I think is an inspiration Yeah, if it can help, it's it's a good thing. Spe- speaking of inspiration, uh, wine. So, so I know you're a, uh, I know you're a big wine connoisseur. I, I I guess you know how long have you you know really sort of had an interest in wine? Because I, I I love wine also. I, you know, I try and learn as much about it as I possibly can, um, you know, because I'm, you know, wine, music, hi-fi are kind of my, my three big, big passions in life. But I know exactly the moment that I discovered red wine and when I guess when red wine in particular kind of finally made sense to me. But, you know, what, what, what got you interested in it? Um, I guess, how long have you been uh, or how long has that kind of been one of the, one of your passions in life? I met uh, Pinot Noir back in uh, 92 and uh, then I started 
exploring that way. And uh, yeah, so basically, basically since then. And you hosted the uh, the natural wine tasting event in in London as well, which I I kicked myself for missing because I only found out about it about I think two days after it actually ha- happened. Um, what was the what was the attendance like? What was the response like at the uh, at the event? Oh, it was a uh, it was a good good event. I had a couple of uh, had a couple of events uh, both international and and also national. And um, yeah, I, I prefer to uh, uh, keep the focus on uh, that that you drink out of uh, passion and uh, recognize why why you enjoy it rather than put too much uh, effort in the, all these technicalities. Mm-hmm. Even though that's uh, many people want. Uh, are very curious to the technicalities, but I, I, I think it's more important to you know, allow people to recognize why do I enjoy uh, this, and then uh, then they can start to develop their own pattern of figuring out what what is the reason why why I enjoy this and that. So it's uh, so it's, it's usually very uh, it, it's very down to earth. Tastings. Um, mm. you're, so, you're not. You're not standing there saying, "I think the sun shone from the <laughs> shone most brightly between three and five o'clock in the afternoon." You know, for this particular harvest. Yeah, we try, we try to avoid that. Uh, so uh, now I, I like to uh, uh, I, when we introduce the wine, and then I like to go from table to table and to, instead of having people asking questions throughout the room, uh, just sit down to and communicate with each different different, different uh, uh, table, basically, so that all the shy people can allow themselves to dare to ask questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, and as somebody who's traveled the, the world, have you any favorite places or favorite countries, um, you know, when it comes to wine, you know, if you had to... If there were five wines on a on a table, they said you can't taste them, but you need to pick one. How you know what would your what would your go to be? Um, I would definitely go to France. Yeah, uh, and uh, most likely should I. Yeah, yeah. There's a. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever been to South Africa. If you ever go, um, make sure that you visit a a vineyard called um, Cavalli. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's there's a there's a whole you know, there's a whole kind of stretch of, of of highway called the wine route, and it's all of the vineyards and all of the the wine farms and stuff like that are along the way. And they also have, I mean, they have their own wine tasting and food bearing and stuff like that for dirt cheap, which is which is amazing. But Cavalli in particular does my absolute favorite wine. Um, the, the, it's called War Horse. It's in this you know beautiful black bottle with this sort of gold, vicious looking horse in the front, but astonishing. It's exactly the kind of red wine that I like. It has. A lot of body, you know. It's it's kind of a the first first uh, sip that you have of it, it. It's a real sort of gut punch, you know, that takes your breath away. But absolutely love it. Um, what are some of your favorite? You know, we spoke about pairings, and this is the, I think this is the one and only time I'll probably talk. I'll probably ask this question on the podcast. What are some of your favorite wine and food pairings? Um, in, impossible to say because there's so many options to it. It's uh, very- the best is if you don't need to pair them. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I do have one in particular, although I, you, you're, you're a vegetarian, right? Um, it's, um, it, it's. Uh, I've been vegetarian on and off. Hmm. Uh, it's more of a industrial concept. That's uh, I, uh, uh, but uh, I prefer vegetarian. Hmm. I was about to say, so I'm not going to be able to sell you on uh, a good dry aged uh, steak and, and and wine bearing. So uh, you you can usually uh, if you if you've uh, eaten it, you basically can remember. It. Mm-hmm. So you you can definitely uh, connect the wine to meat if you. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. It's flavors are memory. So, so it's uh, very, very true. As are, as are smells, actually. 
um, you know, which is like I, I, I had uh, a couple of months back, I actually had um, coronavirus and one of the, the two things that, that go and it's, you know, it's almost like somebody's hacked into your body's DNA and deleted it. Like you, you stop tasting, you stop smelling. It, it was horrific. I remember being able to start tasting wine again for the first time. The first few few times that you drink it, and your your smell and your taste your taste buds on exactly where they need to be. You know, it's like listening to music, but uh, somebody has switched off the mid range and the the left speaker is, is is off. So you kind of you you're getting these little bits of information coming through, and you know it's supposed to be good, but it just it just not it's just not good. Yes. I've got one one last question for you. Uh, you know, if you this body of work that you've built and this this you know this sort of legacy that you leave behind, you know how you know how one day would you love for people to to remember you? And I guess also, you know, is there anything you know in in the journey you've taken that you know in hindsight that you would uh, you would do differently or that you would you would redo if given the opportunity? No, I. Um... Maybe uh, they should remember me from tomorrow, so uh, or the day after I pass. But, uh, it's uh, that would be a decent space. Yeah. Well. I would just want to say thank you so much for being part of my uh, my 100th episode. I've been a very, very big fan of your music for a, you know, a very lengthy period of time. Uh, and it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you. So uh, hopefully, I, I don't know whether you uh, are planning on doing any uh, more wine tasting events once uh, all of the travel bans and stuff have lifted, but uh, hopefully I get to catch you down the road at some point as well. Yeah, it should it should happen. I just released two wines uh, with, uh, it's more of a friendship, a collaboration, uh, that I did with uh, Anthony Totu. Uh, it's the, uh, the house is called La Sorga. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it, most likely there will be uh, we uh, some interesting presentation. Would you ever get more involved in the in in kind of the wine? Uh, you know, I don't want to call it business, but you know, in wine production, you know, you know, maybe kind of starting your own fully fledged label or you know going the the, the way that uh, that satyr has gone for example no i would i would rather i would rather uh, do uh, wine import hmm. uh, there's uh, the uh, the wine uh, farmers should be the ones that uh, get the credit for uh, for the work they created, it's, yeah. So it's of course it can uh, fly, like the ones that are released now. They they are uh, I, I pick the blends, but of course it's uh, it's something that without the knowledge of the of Anthony, it would uh, would, would be the same. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so per personally, I'm more uh, interested in broadcasting good wines than uh, uh, than messing it up yeah I, yeah. I can enjoy uh, I will enjoy drinking that instead so. your your brother produces uh, cider on the on the farm as well right uh, yeah but that's just uh, for the house basically. just for the house so not not yeah, something so, he would he would yeah so I've done that myself from that but yeah it's we have lots of wild, mm -hmm. wild apples growing around, and uh, yeah, we get to use the fruit for something. Great stuff. All right. Well, like I said, I, I really appreciate your time. I know you're a very busy man. I, I'm so looking forward to hearing the uh, the, the full uh, EP, and uh, you know, just just looking forward to you know whatever you you uh, you do in the future. Uh, you know, and again, thanks, thanks very much. I, I really did mean what I said before. I'm I'm not the kind of person who would just pay somebody a compliment for no reason, but I. You know, you're a, you're a true individual and a true pioneer, and I, and I think uh, I think it is it is essential that we have that in uh, in the scene.
You just heard a track called The Humming Mountain off the EP by the same name by Goldsbeard. Um, the, uh, I wouldn't say long awaited follow up to Ghosts Invited, but uh, certainly highly anticipated. Uh, Ghosts Invited was one of my favorite records of uh, 2019, and I've been really psyched uh, to hear what uh, was Gull, what, what Gull was going to do next. And uh, it turns out he has topped his previous work. So, uh, an absolute pleasure having him on the show. I'm uh, very curious to hear everybody's thoughts on, uh, on how that conversation went. I, I, I really kind of warmed to him and, and, and kind of felt like this time round, because obviously those of you that have listened to the podcast for a while know that uh, there was that very infamous moment in 2006, which, by the way, I didn't mention to him because uh, I didn't want to dredge up those memories. Um, but, uh, yeah, that, that moment in 2006 where I did a phone interview with him and it was a fucking disaster. So, um, the uh, you know, this was definitely very different. Um, and, uh, yeah, just an incredibly nice guy. And, again, thank you so much to Katie for getting that set up. Uh, like I said, I really hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, and I know that you guys would have enjoyed that song. If you don't, you're a wimp and you are false. Um, before, through the magic of uh, the Internet, I uh, transport you to uh, a extended news rant with uh, Evan Hopper of Quell. Uh, let's very quickly talk about some new music. Uh, Norse are a duo out of New South Wales and Australia. Um, no doubt beaten down by the draconian lockdown measures of the imbecile that uh, that used to run New South, New South Wales. I, I believe she's now been ousted under a cloud of... Um, of controversy but uh yeah no doubt uh, motivated by her and her bullshit and the fucking boot lackeys that have been beating up people for uh, for having a smoke outside these guys have uh, pulled together one of uh you know or i should say yet another fantastic installment uh in the australian black metal lexicon of 2021 and again you know i think australia really are having an absolutely vintage year when it comes to uh, extreme music uh an ascetic by Norse, available right now on Transcending Obscurity Records, is no different. Um, this is, I believe, their fourth or their fifth record. Um, you know, and it really kind of is a continuation of everything that they've done to date. Uh, you know, there's a lot of discordant riffing that sort of has these very ominous atmospheres that are kind of broken up almost by slight jazz flourishes. Um, uh, you know, backed up by some seriously sick, uh, you know, demonic vocals, phenomenal drumming, and everything is wrapped up in an absolutely fantastic, um, fantastic production. Um, you know, it's it's kind of clean, crisp, you know, without ever sounding like it's uh, like it's too like like it's overproduced. Um, you know, or like you're about to uh, hear someone bust into a uh, into an auto tune chorus at any point soon. Um, I absolutely love this record. It was recommended to me by another uh, Into the Necrosphere alumni who will almost certainly be back on the show at some point, uh, maybe sooner rather than later, uh, Nathan of uh, Gravier. Um, and uh, I am going to uh, lay a track on you right now off of the record. This is Parasite Warmongers.
Parasite Warmongers by Norse off a fantastic record called Ascetic, available right now on Transcending Obscurity Records. Go check them out um, on Bandcamp. And if you buy yourself some merchandise or you buy yourself some music and they ask you who sent you, you let them know that it was old Jackson at Into the Necrosphere. But a great band um, and another great installment in a absolutely fantastic year for Australian metal uh, and a band very worthy of your support. Speaking of bands worthy of your support, um, my buddy Evan Hopper of Quell is up next uh, as we dive into the uh, the latest metal news headlines uh, and we talk a whole load of shit beside. So I, I could think of no better way to uh, to celebrate episode uh, 100 than uh, to have. Uh, my brother Evan on um, doing a, uh, a run through of the news with me, and we'll do this kind of the way that we we would normally do the news, uh, which is or the way I normally do the news, I should say, which is no prep, no nothing. I haven't, I, I consciously don't read much of the news sites uh, in the run up to recording it. I just go and sort of you know try and give as much of an instant reaction as I can, um, and you know I try to stick with the same sites because Metal Storm tends to have the most recent news on. It also tends to cater to the, the the more extreme crowds, and obviously, you know, we we all know what blabbermouth is about. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll we'll get into that. But I, I want to very very quickly just before we uh, get going, I want to talk about the the big news right now, which uh, which is not obviously episode one hundred of Into the Necrosphere, but the fact that you're busy getting your uh, your new record. You how I, how far down the track are you to finishing it now? Because what I've heard so far are you know, relatively complete instrumental tracks, mm-hmm. you know, I will, will say spoiler alert, it's superb. And, you know, I think if you're a fan of music <laughs> wow. that's on this, uh, that, that I feature on this show, you're going to fucking love it. Um, but how far down the track are you with things now? You know, how's the progress been going with that? It's, it's going good, man. Um, and thank you. Thank you so much. That's really kind of you to say, um, right now I'm just finishing up all the bass tracks. And then as soon as the bass is done, I have to send it back over to my buddy, Patrick, so he can just mix everything to the right levels. And then we go into doing vocals and I've already got uh, um, an artist, a uh, photographer uh, lined up to do some uh, some concept that I have for the artwork as well. So pretty much it's just uh, it's it, it's pretty much just holding to uh, getting the vocals done, getting all that mixed together. I've got a couple. Uh, I, I mentioned to you in private uh, that I have a couple guests uh, for this album. That I'm pretty yeah, stoked I, about. I, I wasn't going to mention anything about that because uh, I know you'll want to keep that a surprise. Yeah, I'm going to keep it a secret, but you know, you know what's up, and um, and I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited about that as well. Like, uh, I think it's going to add a, another whole layer to it, and I'm all about like sharing the love as well, and uh, and I'm pretty stoked at the people that uh, say that they want to do some of the lyrical stuff on the on the album are actually down for it because it means a world to me, and uh, yeah, no, it's really cool. So yeah, we're we're down the. I would say, uh, uh, to be um, uh, you know to be modest about it, I would say probably sometime in November we'll have uh, the finished product in hand, and um, anytime sooner than that, when I get to, you know as things start coming in, I'll I'll start making the decision on what I want to like you know put out there as a single or something like that for people to listen to what, but i will what are you i will thinking of of release i mean are you uh, is the plan to put it out to labels and see what comes of that or are you going to just do an independent release i'm going to do it independently yeah. man like I, I what i'll probably end up doing is i'll probably like i'll probably release a single um with that single i'll probably shop that around to a couple guys a couple of different labels um uh, some people i've talked to before and some people i've never talked to at all I'll show them the single. If they're interested in hearing the rest of the stuff, I'll, I'll send that to them in private. If they want to do anything, then that's great. But, you know, I mean, I've done the last two independently. It it doesn't really, like, you know, change much because I don't tour or play shows or anything like that. So everything I do, I do with my own money. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like, I mean, record support would be great, but I, I am, you know, I'm, I'm not, like, beholden to it. Like, it's not, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, my goal, you know? Yeah, I was about to say you could kind of do this with or without their help. Yeah, but, uh, Gary Holt, I think I spoke to him years back, and he was talking to me about. Um, I think it, it. I can't remember whether it was 
Tempo of the Damned or whether it was um, the the first of the two exhibit albums, but they were without a label before that. And they actually did the, they were one of the first bands that I'd spoken to at the time who kind of went that way where they did a, a whole record, self-financed it, and then went to the labels and said, all right, we've got a full album. Here's a single of what it sounds like. You know, are you, are you interested? You know, here's a taste. Are you interested right. in the rest? Um, I think that's a, I think that's a smart strategy, but like I've said before, I, I do feel like, Based on the number of good bands that I get through that are unsigned, there are a lot of folks uh, in the music industry sleeping on their hands at the moment, man. Like you well, guys, yeah. if, if I if I had the cash and I could sign and I could start a label and I, you know, I knew how the music industry worked, um, then I would sign you guys for sure. Masters Call, Privax, Stellar Master Elite, um, the uh, that band out of Los Angeles that I flip out so much about, Born Ultra. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, fucking I, oh, how they have not been picked up is criminal well same with stellar master leave and trevax as well like, yes. I mean, yeah, yeah yeah it's insane i mean like the quality of musicianship there with those music like with those albums it's just like it's it's, a, it's phenomenal mm. and i mean and i mean i i don't know again you know maybe it's you know you you talk to like katie and people like that and like uh, you know i don't know what it, what it's like on uh, on the business side of things but I, I imagine it has something to do with like you know how many followers you have and like how many units you're moving and all this kind of stuff but for me as a as an yeah. artist it's like when i put out this stuff i kind of i don't want to say I, I don't like saying like punk rock attitude but like it is kind of like that like i just put the i put the money into the project i sell the um like the actual physical copies of things at the the cheapest price i can sell it just to make my money back and just to cover the the shipping costs of everything like you know i'm not looking to get rich off anything and and frankly i mean all the stuff that i do you can find it on bandcamp or spotify for free so you know you don't even have to buy the stuff that i do i, I really am just more happy if i can get whatever i invested into something back and then if people like it you know then whatever you know i, I mean i feel like it's more important that people have access to the music in any format versus like whether or not I'm signed or, you know, I don't know. It, it kind of feels weird, like to say, like, you know, to to be in a band or a solo project and like your only goal or ambition is to get signed because I mean to make money. Yeah, well, that was well, yeah. that was like a that was a goal, I think, like in a day in time, like, you know, back in the 90s and 80s and stuff like that, when that that actually meant something, but these days that doesn't really mean anything, you know? Yeah. It's I was like, about to say, you could be signed and, and, you know, you could be shifting 20, 30,000 copies of your, your album worldwide. You're still gonna have to work a job. Yeah. Um, as a matter yeah, of fact, yeah. probably there's, there's kind of this, I, I'm, and I might be wrong here, but I would imagine there's this inflection point where it's actually less hassle for you to just do everything yourself and kind of let the, you know, let the project, live a life of its own yeah. uh, and then you do your day job rather than have to deal with all the record company stuff and you know etc cetera, etc cetera. because you know with with being signed comes all sorts of responsibilities you know having to do press having to do this that and the other you know a lot of i would not imagine that smaller bands uh would get the leeway that like Cole would get for example to say i'm not doing press with a lot of people or i'm only speaking right. to I was speaking to five reporters and the rest can go fuck themselves. <laughs> it's like, so but he also, he also paid his dues. And like, you know, I mean, he has that, he has that freedom to do that because, you know, people know that regardless of whether or not he does one press interview or like a hundred press interview, it's going to result in the same kind of a thing. Like I was about to say, they know yeah. who he is. I'll yeah. tell you something now, by the time people get to this point of the podcast, they will have heard the the conversation. Uh, he's uh, it was, it took, a, it was, a, it was some, some serious work to get him to, to loosen up. A yeah. Bit. Yeah. I can imagine. Um, I can imagine. But. but he's a, he's a super nice guy. We actually, it's a shame. We kind of spoke for about 20 minutes offline after the interview. Yeah. And, and, by the end of the interview, we were talking about wine and things like that. And that seemed to really kind of spark him up. And I kind of, I was reflecting on it afterwards. And I started, I was thinking to myself, I think this is a dude who kind of, I, I think the, the process of creation is so intimate to him and such a, a something he keeps so private. I actually think in, in, in hindsight, and if I ever get the opportunity to speak to him again, I might just forego talking about music whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, and really just focus on stuff that he's, that he's in, interested in otherwise, but he's it's difficult I, though, because I mean, he's goal and you want to ask him the questions about music and oh, you yeah, want, yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, so but of then also go for that, like for sure. But then, then I was thinking to myself, like the, the, that's kind of part of the, of the, of the magic is that the guy has, has managed to in an era where it's so difficult to do that because 
for better or worse, artists are so accessible and they and we know so much about people's personal lives. The era of mystery is kind of gone. You know, those days mm. of people wondering who are the guy, you know, who's Gene Simmons behind the mask. I mean, right, that's right. that's gone forever. Yeah. He's been one of the few artists that's managed to to retain that kind of sense of mystery, which in part I think sometimes is what makes his music so exciting as well, and what makes him so fascinating as a as a character. But I, I, I will say, um, you know, I, one I felt redeemed after the story, and I didn't I didn't share the story with him after the story no. from two thousand six. Um, you know, where uh, the, the, the either fucking aborted 20 minute interview. Oh, right. Yeah, also, yeah. though, now that I've spoken with him on Zoom, the other thing that I'll say is if I ever get a chance to speak to him again, I'll foot the bill, but I'll fl- I will fly to Norway and do it in person. Oh, yeah. I, th- I think he's, I don't think he's somebody who, I mean, I know he said on Thomas uh, Erickson's podcast that he doesn't do phone anymore. Well, yeah, but I think um, they did it, didn't they? On Thomas's uh, podcast, I think they went to, were they at yeah, his Th- gallery? They were at yeah, his yeah, yeah. Thomas went to yeah, his gallery. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I think I think if I get an opportunity to do it again, that's what I would do. I'd go I'd go to the gallery. But uh, be careful with that. Be careful with that, like uh, passion project thing, because you'll end up with like uh, Joe Rogan, like interviewing uh, James Hetfield and talking about bees for like uh, two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I remember that podcast actually. No. That was I, I didn't think that was a bad. No, episode. it was good. It was, it was good. It was. Just, I thought I I got a I got a. It restored a little bit of my love for James. No, no, it was great. It was it was some great. kind of monster killed the vast majority. Oh, of, of course, of course, yeah, yeah. But at some point, it was just like this motherfucker still talking about bees. Oh okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, as as I said, I think with Gol, uh, I think doing it in person is the way to go. Um, right. Yeah. But I, I I I I really enjoyed the conversation. I hope people get out of it what they want. I was I posted about it yesterday on Instagram, and obviously, you know, everyone is super super excited about it. You know, but he seems it, also like. Um, uh you know i'm more i can speak for myself i'm more of an extroverted person whereas yes. my little brother is actually a, quite an in, introverted person and i grew up with him and i've seen introverts and he strikes me as an introvert and one of the one of the main things about like getting an introvert to open up is that they feel comfortable with you you know and that can take time you know so maybe that is a great idea to like be there have some time hanging out with him prior to actually doing the interview he gets a feel for you he's like okay I can trust this guy. He's not going to railroad me in the press or he's not trying to yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, whatever, whatever. Well, well, that too, you know, so interest, interestingly, as folks will have seen, we we talk at length about the Vice documentary, oh, okay. about how that went down. So he's never watched it back. He, he kind of felt like they were like, I think Peter Best is the guy's name is a good guy. He was, by the time that the, that the, um, yeah, that the interview ends, He's, he was actually so pissed off. He had kicked everybody out of his house, barring the uh, barring the other guy, one, okay. the, the Peter Best guy. Yeah, and Peter then, Best. Uh, uh, if you don't know, Peter Best is a um, I think he's American, uh, American or Canadian. I think American, American photographer, and he did this really cool photography book um, uh, about uh, all like the black metal scene in Norway back when it was like happening. And uh, he's got some like some of the most iconic photos in black metal like not the frost the nata frost with holding the upside down cross but that's peter best took that photo yeah. um in i didn't furnace. know that actually yeah yeah in, in furnace uh, standing in the alleyway where the old woman's like walking up the alleyway in the back that peter best took that photo so all of those photos he he went there to document the whole thing i think way before vice was even a thing yeah, um, yeah. and uh and that's so that's how he has that connection and he was because I, I remember in that documentary, uh, the Vice one, that if you look in the credits, you see his name pop up. I think he was kind of like the liaison for like Vice to get to, even though they did it with like a Norwegian like film crew and all that. Like he was the one they had to go yeah. through to get to to well, uh, Gaul. Yeah, yeah. Well, the point of it was originally. I mean, it's called True Norwegian Black Metal. The point of it is to be a Norwegian black metal documentary, but it turned into a documentary about Gaul. And then I, I I rewatched it prior to speaking to Gold just to kind of refresh my memory on it. And I remember not liking it when it came out. Yeah. But rewatching it again now, I'm I'm amazed. And I said this to him as well, uh, just how tacky it was. Right. You know, they they the way the framing and the editing and stuff is done. Like when they go when they go to his house, I mean, it's like fucking. They're like they're about to meet Leatherface for the right. first yeah, time. Yeah. You know, and it's like I mean, there's some like stuff that literally looks like if you if you if you cut it into like one of those fan trailers. <laughs> oh, yeah. I swear to God, you could cut it into. Blair Witch Project or House of Blair Witch Project for something like Gaul that, Returns. Right? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was uh, disappointed with that too. Like, you know, I mean, like, don't get me wrong. Like, I understand like how crazy it must have been for for those guys to like have to like just strap on whatever clothes they had and hike that mountain. 
but like if they had to do that. But if they had the right, <laughs> if they had the right interviewer, like that would have been the, the coolest fucking thing in the world. Like you know, like I'd do it in a heartbeat if he was like, "Hey, you want to go yeah, yeah, check yeah. out my grandparents' uh, like cabin up in the woods?" I'd be like, let's go. Well, because like, that's also <laughs> you think about it, right? He's he's actually opening up something pretty intimate yeah. for people to 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 see that, that that you know like we spoke before about like the mystery but actually it's this weird kind of dichotomy where he's there's this mystery but then there's also like this extreme openness about certain things like you know how he lives where he lives like you know family background and stuff like that i i would have taken it as an affront some of the questions that 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 he, that, that guy was asking me were i him and then the the one thing that i picked up at the end of the, the conversation where you know he gets fucked off and he stares into the distance for right. four minutes on end i mean the, the biggest mistake the guy made there was he, gold had spent the better part of five days talking to him about how you know this is all about thinking for yourself and you shouldn't be you know euro worshiping or idolizing anybody and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then the guy goes um guide me at the end like he's some fucking right. charles manson cult leader and that was right. like you could you could tell that that's when the that's when yeah, things that's went he said he, he dangerously missed, he missed the point he missed the yeah. point entirely it's like i'm yeah, not yeah. A, you know, i know yeah it, the guy was a bad interviewer like hands down i mean you know it's just it was just a poor choice for somebody you know to get this hipster boy to go hang out with gall like probably hasn't heard like a note of Gorgoroth's music prior to like actually being assigned to the project. So yeah, yeah, I know. But Hey, uh, before we get into the news, I just want to say to you, congratulations. One <laughs> Thank you very much, man. Yeah, man. How does it feel? Uh, it's feel? fucking great. Uh, yeah. It's absolutely, yeah, it's absolutely awesome, man. And, and, and the, and the best thing about it is, is, is how it's not just reaching 100. It's how much cool stuff is, is waiting in the wings, um, you know, right. going, going forward. So, uh there's for episode 101 i'll i'll break this as a as an announcement to folks who have uh you know dare to listen this far into the show <laughs> right. uh episode 101 is terence hobbs of suffocation okay. um and i'll tell you something right now that dude had a lot to say so yeah yeah <laughs> So I met him once at a uh, Maryland death fest and he couldn't have been the nicer dude. Fucking like he, yeah. badass guy. Yeah. Like just total badass. Yeah, and then Shane Embry is hopefully still in the pipeline. Um right. that would uh, be a cool a, one. Yeah, for sure. There's another that might guy. be like a two-parter. I don't even know how you could even cover that guy's career in like one episode. But he's like, quite an introvert too, though. So I, oh, okay. I, I fear that could be one of those where because I tend to I, I, I'll, I'll watch how he responds in interviews. He tends to be quite matter of fact. So uh, he's not like someone like Terrence who will just open up and just talk. You know, yeah, it's just like yeah. you and I are talking now. Right. So, but we'll see. We'll see how it goes. The thing is, sometimes it surprises you as well. I mean, when I spoke with Sam uh, from uh, from Antichrist Imperium. Um, and from werewolves, I mean, I didn't count on us talking for nearly three hours. Right. Uh, but I mean, that conversation could have carried on at least another two hours. As well, yeah, so. yeah. But anyway, so yeah, so that's in the wedding of the wings. I've got another guy who I'll keep secret until it's in the bank. Yep. Uh, but in my view, anyone who any any anyone who listens closely to the podcast will know who I'm talking about. He reached out to me last week, actually, and just said, you know, he's discovered the show, really likes it. One of the best drummers on the face of the earth, in my view. He's a drummer for uh, on two releases that are definitely going to be in the, my top twenty of twenty twenty one. So that was fucking cool to get. So there's yeah. So there's uh, like between now and the end of the year, I've got a I've got a fucking great lineup of people. Oh, that's great. Um, and then and then uh, hopefully it's going to go ahead. But I spoke with Mike. Um, he's going to do um, one part of my best of twenty twenty one with me, and yeah. then Kelly is going to do the other one. Because oh, like I, I felt like in terms of of getting folks together who will have different, ta like to different tastes to mine and bring some different names to the table. It's, right. You know, it's all about sort of sharing as much as we as much different stuff as we can. They'll they'll be the ones to do that. So yeah, and those guys' chemistry with well, you know, it's just it's great. Like both Kelly yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and Mike have great chemistry, and they they're not afraid to talk at all. Like so, that's awesome. Yeah. That's well, awesome. that's the Looking one thing that I'll, 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 I'll say before we jump into the news. You know, so hundred episodes in. There's two things that are that that I'm. When I started the show, I never in a million years thought I would I would get to that point, and that has been the two best takeaways for me from doing the podcast. Is number one is all the people I've made friends with. Um, you know, you, Cheyenne, Marco, Mike, um, Kelly, Katie. You know, just tons and tons of people. You know, Matt, Sam from um, Werewolves. I just spoke about him now. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, all these people that I've connected with and I and I, you know, consider to be friends now, um, you know, that I I, you know, never ever would have thought to, you know, would would I've never never thought that I would hit it off with them as well as I did. And then uh the other thing is the the just the the I guess the community that's kind of swelled up around the around the podcast. I mean, it's 
I'm not. I'm fortunately not big enough yet to where I'm. Uh, I'm getting criticism all the time because the news section, I'm sure, would be full of that. But uh, for the most part, I've never once had a single email saying the show sucks. You're an asshole. How dare you say this? I've never been. I've now had no one trying to cancel me or. Um, but it's I'm a testament all... to your character, man. Uh, you're, yeah, you have maybe. a good character, you know. And, and... <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, yeah. it was, like legitimately, you have a great character. You know, you you you're not afraid to speak your mind. You wear your heart on your sleeve, and and everyone who listens knows that, you know. And that's why the community is like you know around you, and and that's why you've made it this long. And yeah, man, you know, just you know, just keep on doing what you do. I mean, there's nothing like th- this format works, and everyone loves it, you know. So I mean, yeah, you struck a you know lightning in a bottle man you really did no, <laughs> and, that, I, I and cheers it. to you man cheers to you i appreciate it mate yeah it's it's still 11 o'clock here so i i thought better of cracking open a beer the, no i the, know the closest and you got something thing to I do later to liquid, so. yes, screen yeah, yeah. cleaner <laughs> <laughs> just just sniff some glue you'll be all right some glue. Yeah. <laughs> all right uh i'm gonna share my screen and we'll jump straight into uh let's do it into the metal storm let's see what these jokers have going on all right so First up, we'll ignore that stuff. When I when I opened it up prior to you coming on, the thing that caught my eye immediately was this article. So suicidal tendencies, Instagram account disabled due to band's name. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so it says here, with all the recent policies of disallowing people to promote or glorify suicide and self-harm famous on several social medias these days, it's expected that something is bound to get wrong for the metal scene. I don't know who wrote this article, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. It's what happened to suicidal tendencies. They revealed their Instagram got taken down. The statement of the band on the matter was, this isn't the first time we've been flagged, but hopefully it'll be the last. We'll go into that more later, but right now we want to focus on the positive and give our best to you all and say thanks for always standing with us. The account ban happened uh, right after a mid-September report by Wall Street Journal, along with rumors, so, along which rumors stated that Facebook and Instagram had been allowing the proliferation of conspiracy and extremist movements. So I'll touch on that in a second because I, I think this whole business of that so-called whistleblower is so fucking shady. It's unbelievable. Yeah. It, it's turned out that she's been coached by um, very prominent people in the uh, in the DNC. Um, you know, she has the same lawyer as I think um, some other other fake whistleblower that came out. And, you know, the fact is in all of her testimony and all of her bullshit, she's not really said anything that nobody knows already. I mean, you know, teenage girls feel bad when they see more attractive teenage women on Instagram. No shit. I mean, glamour, glamour magazines have been doing that for years. Um, but you've never seen the Democrats go, we need to, we need to stop those glamour magazines variety and, you know, all this other shit you know, off the shelves. Right. But the other thing that I thought was hysterical as, as a sidebar on this uh, in her testimony is um, she says uh, it would be a great a great thing if there were a regulatory body where somebody like I could go and work and we could, uh, you know, we could uh, something like regulate or monitor uh, Facebook's content. Mm-hmm. So she's basically saying, I worked for Mark Zuckerberg. I would like Mark Zuckerberg to now work for me. <laughs> so right, I right. want to go start this government body and then I can I can exert top-down control on everything that they post. It's fucking I also ironic. think it's ridiculous that like on some level, this is like these people feel like this is a win. That like they got oh, yeah. like suicidal tendencies Instagram account disabled. It's like, I mean, it it's okay, yeah, it's a win, I guess, if that was what your goal was, but at the same time, it's like, what did you really accomplish? You know, I mean. You stopped I stopped a, an underground metal band from like using their Instagram account. Like the only thing you're doing is just, you know, enraging a bunch of people and not I mean, this band isn't I mean, we know suicidal tendencies. I was just about to say, I mean, it's not like they've just started and it's you know, no, no one knows you suicidal tendencies. Right, right, all right. those millions of people wearing suicidal t-shirts. Don't, don't know where that came from. Right. This is a funny comment though. I like some kind of some kind of people what have activist tendencies. What next? Take Facebook cooking over fire page because Greta are vegan. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, as I said, I mean, this to me is just it's 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 typical. I wouldn't say peak 2021. It's typical 2021. Yeah. Um, and and this uh, this whole business of uh, this all this groundswell of nonsense coming around Facebook and, and Instagram promote extremist content. That is an excuse for the government to control 
what gets posted on Facebook and, and look, uh, man, like I, I have no problem with like, you know, if you're, <clears throat> if you're a fucking like Nazi group on there, like, you no, know, fuck yes. Yeah. yeah no, I agree get rid that. of them, get rid of them, you know, but suicide tendency. I mean, th- I said this before on the podcast, you know, it's, it's all good in the hood when like they can get rid of bands they don't like, but when, just wait. Cause this shit, you know, you start, you know, my, my mom always said like, you know, you point a finger, you got three like pointing back, you know, it's like, you know, you start, you start ostracizing bands like this. Well, then eventually, you know, if the rules go for everything, well, then your bands are going to start getting canceled yeah. too, you know? And then you're well, gonna, that's when people start backpedaling. That's when people are like, well, wait a minute. Yeah, <laughs> we don't yeah. need well, all you, bands. You can see we just it, mean yeah. these bands. Like, you can see it in Hollywood now. I mean, there's, there's all this talk about how, um, you know, this person and this person is, um, or, you know, cancel culture has gone too far and all this fucking bullshit. And it's like, right, right. Mm, I think that we all know that uh, you, uh, you now that it's now that it's it's sniffing closer to home. You're you're a little nervous. Well, when they let Bill Cosby out of jail, you didn't hear anybody like saying like this is a huge win for yeah. Yeah. no one. No one spoke, stuck stuck up for him. Yeah. <laughs> not not so, no. But they they sure were they sure were saying that he was being railroaded in the beginning. You know, but yeah, then yeah, yeah. but then then it, all the news came out and like oh no he's a horrible man. And then yeah. they let they let him out of prison, and then like no one's saying nothing about that now. So yeah. you know the inconsistencies, man. <laughs> well, you know this is this is it ties into something you just said. It's about I've spoken about this before um, it, it, about principle. You know, you can know straight away that people are full of shit when it when they latch onto these kind of buzzwords or uh, buzz lines and shit that. Really, right. if, if they had any sort of principle, they would look at it and go, this is fucked. You, you know, you how can you possibly how can you possibly think that that somebody should should think or operate this way? Yeah, and um, it's because they don't read like they read headlines. Yeah. They don't they yeah, don't yeah. actually do any. Yeah. And, they, and, but, and like I said, they have no principle. They have no moral compass of their own to measure it by to say, if you allow the government to start monitoring what's on social media, eventually, you know, as a as a Democrat, eventually, when the Republicans come in, that means they can do that, too. Right. So. Yeah, it's exactly. the same as with, with and they with, will, they will, because they'll be so pissed off with all this shit yeah. that you put them through. The next thing you know, they're going to turn around and just do it right back. Well, they'll That's have, gonna, like, they'll for sure also have, you know, voters that you know. If you think about the amount of Christian support they have, you know, they'll, they'll have a lot of voters that go, "Well, you can't have pro-life stuff on uh, what's him." Oh, sorry, on pro-life, you can't have pro-choice, right, right, right. on on, on yeah. Facebook, things like that. But anyway. Uh, death special events around announced uh, in December to commemorate oh, the cool. 20th anniversary of the passing of Chuck's Cool Diner. That's how I've heard, by the way, his name is supposed to be pronounced. They had, um, I don't remember what podcast it was. Yeah, it was like School yeah. Diner, I think, was the was the way that his manager uh, pronounced it. Um, I always said it Schuldner, but like- I, I also said Schuldner. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, this is cool. Um, Chuck, uh, I think so- T- Terrence called him Chuck Death the other day. I think that's the best <laughs> way to do it. My um, buddy, uh, um, a guy, uh, it will Matt Harvey. He's in Exhumed and Gruesome. Uh, mm-hmm. when, when I was living in California, he, he's from the area that I was living in. He's a super nice guy. All the guys in Exhumed are super nice guys. And uh, I saw this post on his uh, on his Facebook, and and he's done this before. He they had like a, a thing called Death. I think it was called Death to All. It was a tour similar yeah, to yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. They did two dates. I think that that one they did like one in LA and like one on the East Coast. Um, and they had like members of Obscura and other people like in the band. But this is cool because I mean this actually has uh, um, the, the the coolest part is the James Murphy, you know, because James Murphy was actually like you know uh, played along with Chuck and like uh, yeah, in yeah. the band. So, so I mean this is really neat. I'm, and I'm super I'm super stoked for for all the guys, but especially for my friend too, like to get uh, another chance to, to do this. Like that, this is so cool. Those death to all shows. Um, Cause I think brutal assault had a couple on their, um, on their, what was it? Um, their uh, YouTube channel. Okay. Um, and they were fucking badass. They're phenomenal. Really, yeah. And they really bring really out, cool. they, they'll bring up everybody. Like, you know, they, mm. you know, every, and like every time they do them, they have like just an all-star lineup of, of great, drummers bassists and guitar players i mean it's just phenomenal and it's great to see like death still being celebrated like this this much yeah. longer like you know what i what i find insane is the number of things i see on social media where people will go oh i only just discovered death can't believe it took me so long it's like well what the hell is wrong with you man <laughs> you're living under it's a like, rock <laughs> it's like exactly are you not um you know like like when i got into metal i 
it wasn't long before I, I kind of went back to the roots and I was like, oh, I, I want to hear where this shit comes from. So, you know, listen to Sabbath, listen to Led Zeppelin, uh, you know, all the way up through Judas Priest and Motorhead and stuff like that. I've always, maybe I'm just different in that regard, but I've always had a, an intellectual curiosity about if I'm, if I'm into a certain kind of music or, or, or what have you, then I want to find out where, where it comes from, you know, what the roots are. So yeah, how are you I, into any sort of extreme music, but you don't know death is a fucking disgrace. Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, I, I've thought about it too sometimes. And I think sometimes it has something to do with the fact that we were, even though we were removed from it by years, we weren't so far removed from it as kids yeah. are these days, you know. I yeah, mean, maybe. now you have to go through Slipknot to get to Cannibal Corpse to get to death. Like, you know, like now there's so many more like steps to get back to that like original thing. I don't know. I don't know either. You have to, to me, get through uh, Corey Taylor's Nostril <laughs> photos from. Yeah, to me, thing. to me, it just seems like a, an obvious thing too. Like I, uh, for me, I'm the same. Like intellectual, like um, um, what would you call it, adventure? Cur- or curiosity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so Mortuary Drape joins forces with Peaceful Records. Peaceful okay. Records are extremely pleased to announce that one of the longest running bands in the Italian scene cult black metal legends mortuary drape have signed to the label details right. of the first release for the label a mini album entitled wisdom vibration repent will be released very shortly stay tuned um this to me i i, I don't really uh i'm not actually usually familiar with mortuary drape but this to me uh, is a great they're an old doom old uh, kind of doom kind of metal band like oh really yeah kind of uh, i'll get i'll get you in trouble well, the podcast in trouble let's say this but they say do whatever like, you want man. yeah it's just like kind of like you know doom doom uh, in reference to like bands like Candlemass and stuff like that, like not, oh, okay, Doom, okay. not Doom compared to like what Doom is today, like yeah, with like a black metal slant to it, I guess. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah, slower mid so, songs and stuff. You like know, that. Peaceful Records is a good example to me. Why? Why are they not just taking a chance on a bunch of new bands? It's you know, strange, they, right? They, I mean, they, 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 they made whole, their name off of off a bunch of, of new friend. bands. Yeah, yeah exactly. Friend. Back yeah, to back yeah, in I mean, the day. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, maybe because now they're established, they they like, now they cherry pick what they want as well, but. It does seem strange that a record label that was founded on taking risks no longer takes risks. I, I don't same, know. same deal with uh, Earache. Um, to a yeah. lesser degree, same deal with Nuclear Blast. Nuclear Blast seem to be kind of moving a l- getting a little bit more um, edgy they're again nowadays. Back. They're coming back around. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, they they still have hypocrisy on the label, which I don't, I don't understand because I like, feel like they lost a lot of um, you know. There's other labels that came up, like that Napalm Records came up and like stole a lot of bands from from Nuclear Blast, and, as well as other. They've just and stole same, a same Nile, the, by the way. Oh yeah. yeah did yeah. you see that? Yeah, I did. That's yeah, a yeah. really really big signing for them. I mean, Nile yeah. are a, are a big band. Yeah, and then um, you know, and and. Nuclear Blast did the same thing to like, uh, if I if I'm correct with my my knowledge, like uh, Nuclear Blast did the same thing to like Century Media. A lot of mm-hmm. bands were on Century Media for a long time. Century Media was stiffing people, so Nuclear Blast stood up, and like a lot of bands went from Century Media to Nuclear Blast, and then now Nuclear Blast did the same thing. So now, yeah, and then all these record labels are still they're still around to some capacity. So now we'll see. Maybe they do try and uh, sign some unknown bands. They should. That's what people are listening I, to. I, I don't know. think they will. Like I said, if I look at how they've operated in the last couple of years, the the, the unknown bands they do sign are, are garbage. But uh, <laughs> I just don't. I just like I said, I just don't get why one of these labels just don't go look. I mean, I know I know I get that there's a lot of money that you need to put into this, but I mean, you also will hopefully have been around the scene long enough to know what's gonna you know what's gonna connect with people and what isn't. And I for sure know that um, you know the bands that I mentioned earlier. They will, they will connect. I mean, yeah. I think it's a disgrace that a band like Udkana, you know, no, no disrespect to Pest Records, but like, how the fuck is that record on a Chinese label, you know, so that no one's ever heard of ever? Right. I mean, it's one of the it, 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 best record last year, in my opinion, and and that was in a, that was in a uh, a, a lineup of some seriously stiff competition. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. Anyways. Uh, and Oceans enter the studio. I really like that last And Oceans album. Yeah, what was that uh, called? Cosmic Mother or something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something yeah. like that. Co- yeah, Cos- that was cool. Cos- or something like that. Yeah, that was a cool album, man. That was cool. Yeah, it yeah, was excellent. Yeah. Very surprising. So glad to hear that that's happening. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Beast in Black. Somebody sent this to me earlier. Yeah, looks like not, Nightwish. I've not like listened Sabaton. to it. It looks fucking awful. <laughs> <laughs> you know, again, how how... How do grown men in this day and age pose for a photo that looks like this? I have no idea. 
<laughs> oh, that's worse. even better. That's even better, man. Even worse. Uh, I mean that that looks like it was <laughs> done on fucking Paint Shop Pro for you know on a 2006 edition computer. Oh no, they definitely have. There's a gloss. There's a glossy uh, uh, blur on the left hand side of of uh, the the tall guy on the left there, and like yeah, this is this is basic Photoshop. Oh, bad. Sure, oh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, there's well, a, so. so so somebody writes here there is enough cheese here to provide topping for a thousand pizzas but seriously who doesn't like pizza yeah. uh, I mean, I who knows? they're probably good at what they do but uh, uh no yeah. thank you <laughs> no I, i'm not uh i'm even i'm even getting to a point where i'm not really all that interested anymore in 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 gore lyrics as an example <laughs> I, I i don't i don't find it interesting I'm sick and tired of hearing about women getting murdered in, in, in metal. Like the last Cannibal Corpse album was a, was a good album. But again, how many more fucking times do I want to hear about yeah, being, yeah. being massacred? Like one thing that I've always appreciated about suffocation and, and, and immolation as an example, and I spoke to Terrence about it too. There was always been a, uh, it was, their lyrics were always more reality based. And for me, that actually gave the band a slightly, it gave them a harder edge um it, it 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 made the music feel grittier and, and just a little nastier to me because it deals with the terrifying things that you know we all know about you know yeah, real life stuff. that we all, yeah, that we all yeah. deal with rather than fucking z- z- zombies i mean how many more fucking songs can you sing about zombies <laughs> I'm not, I don't you know, know. and i guess you know i'm hypocritical because i don't mind the satan lyrics <laughs> i mean there's like the thing with with the, with the satanic lyrics is very often you can't hear them anyway. Secondly, they it it it's more that that's less to me about. I guess it's still a gimmick, but it's not. Yeah, like it, it, as... it, 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 it's a gimmick, but it, there's 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 a it, for me that's about rebellion. It's not about anything else. Right, right. So yeah. I don't. Uh, so that doesn't bother me so much. But yeah. Anyways, uh, we move on. Um, it's not a huge amount else here that I'm that's that's catching my fancy. Uh, oh, I tell you what, though. Also on this show, I will have reviewed it and people have heard by the time that I, I get to this. Uh, there's a band out of Australia that just put out a great record called... Uh, the band's called Norse. The okay. record is called Ascetic. Um, fucking excellent stuff. Okay, cool. I'll really, check really that cool. Out. Yeah. yeah. It's been... It, it, it's, it's felt a little on the quiet side for new releases. Like, there was a time where, like, you didn't know what to start with and now it's kind of like... You uh, you have to really dig around a little bit through the through the muck, and I, hey. I sometimes I worry and I go, am I just getting old? But then I I listen to stuff that's that's out, and I'm like, this just doesn't this does nothing for me. Can you can you put a timestamp here real quick? I, I'm so sorry, but I have to use the bathroom really quick. Yeah, no worries. No, 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 no worries at all. All right, now we're back in business. There you go. Well, I mean, it was incredibly rude being at my, you know, 100th episode. Oh, I know, so I know. Man. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> you know, I was considering just pissing in my pants and like, and just, uh, <laughs> just. No, I was, I was just gonna, I was just gonna give you a lot of passive aggressive shit. It's like I, I hate when people are like that. You know, when you, when, 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 like, I've been in these situations where you do something and you're like, oh, listen, apologies, I just need to do this quickly or whatever the case may be, and then they like they'll they'll throw these little. These little nuggets at you all the time, uh, like, oh, you know, it's, it's only it's only my birthday. It's only, it's only <laughs> it's my birthday. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I'll tell you, of all bands that I do not see the point of them ever coming back, but I guess there'll be people that'll that'll like it. Uh, Dutch atmospheric rock combo, The Gathering, are thrilled to reveal the name and cover artwork for their eleventh pointless full-length studio album called beautiful distortion it's scheduled for release in early spring 2022 and clocks in at almost 50 minutes with eight tracks oh god what Uh, i mean yeah good for them but what a fucking overrated load of shit and this band as well. I've said it before, but worst name on the face. <laughs> I of the know, earth. I know. Dark it's Woods, so my betrothed. I mean, that's literally. You mentioned earlier about God of the Simps. <laughs> that's literally what that is. That's the that's if if all the Simps in the world got together and said, "Let's vote on on the name of a, let's vote on the name of a metal band," it would be God Dark Woods, my betrothed. And like the photo too, again with the photo, like. Just don't get it, dude. Man. One thing I've 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 considered uh, getting on my uh, or including in my news section because I want I kind of sometimes want the news section to be a little bit more than just news and just more straight bullshitting, right? Because um, I originally, I mean, I'll tell you where I got the idea from. Uh, you've listened to Adam Carolla, I'm sure. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know when Adam Garola and these folks talk about the news, that's sort of yeah, what, yeah, yeah. What, what this is. But what I what I want to start doing, just because it's so fucking hysterical, if you ever want to laugh, if you're feeling down and despondent about life and you want to you want to you want to laugh at the rest of humanity, go onto the Twitter account or Instagram of any porn star and read some of the some of the uh the comments. Uh uh-huh. yeah, it yeah, is yeah. fucking insane because you'll have stuff like you know, Phoenix Marie will turn up. Uh, we'll have a photo of her in full makeup, looking looking amazing. Right. Um, just woke up, having an ugly day. <laughs> and then it's like, and then the the message comes. You know, the messages come in. What's wrong, hun? Hope everything's okay. One guy the other day posted to uh, a, a woman. Um, blah blah. You know, I've sent you many photos. I hope you will choose me. <laughs> it's like. How do you think of the 500,000 followers this woman has sending her the same shit every single day? You're going to, they're going to, they're going to suddenly stop whatever it is they're doing. Look at your, your picture or your pathetic message and go, oh, fucking hell, this changes everything. The worst part though, is these marks, like they don't realize that they're just like, you know, they're just part of her or his or whoever's like uh well they 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 part of the main line of validation that that she gets well that and like and it's you know that influx of comments every single day like you know people are like oh it must be so hard for it's like no she's taking that all the way to the bank because every time she's got like ten thousand comments on one post like you know she gets another check from instagram or whoever like for that like you know so i mean i don't think it's that but it, it is hilarious though like to your point like do you really think that she's just going to fall in love with that post you just sent and be like, oh my God, I found so, my soul. So here's right? one. I'm just on the, I'm just on Phoenix Marie's Instagram. Um, and she's dressed in a, what's the name? She's dressed in a, a wedding dress on the picture. Uh-huh. That And the, the, the caption is that left at the hotel room, not the altar vibes, LOL. And then the, uh, the, the comments come beautiful dot, dot, dot looking so beautiful. <laughs> And then it's so creepy. So beautiful as always. You are just fucking awesome. We were talking, I love you so much. <laughs> me and a friend were talking about this the other day, and we were talking about um dick pics and like how ridiculous well, that's the a, worst. a dick yeah. pic is, right? Like, listen, let's just get it out there for anybody who's listening to this that thinks that your penis is attractive, it's not. Okay. It's <laughs> it looks like every other fucking dick. <laughs> Uh, but to think that a woman would fall in love with you because you sent her a picture of your your one eyed snake, like, dude. But uh, this the thing I don't understand is why do so many guys continue to do it? Like this, so many women I, I, I'll, I, I'll talk to, and I'll I'll kind of you know partly because I'm curious, but I'll make a joke and I'll be like, oh yeah, you must be you must get a load of dick pics on uh, on Bumble or on Tinder or whatever. And they're like, yeah, that loads. And I, I what I don't understand is the 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 thinking process that gets you to the point. Where you go right time to unzip and show her what i'm working you know, what yeah. i'm packing <laughs> and then and then to think i can send it to her and she's gonna go jesus this is incredible i, I think mean, it's, one, this- it's one thing if you're with that person like in a romantic relationship but like when it's a total stranger like no. i mean dude come on never mate. never <laughs> it's, it's never right it's it's, it's i completely agree with you and, 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 and might be because i'm straight but it's it looks like a gnarled fucked up piece of old wood it's just <laughs> You know, that people will look at it just discard in the dumpster. It's completely utilitarian. There's nothing that's attractive about it. I, I do not understand why guys think it's a good idea. It looks it looks like an elephant trunk that someone's shoved a broomstick up the, the <laughs> middle of it. Like <laughs> But the, the 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 comments on here get worse, by the way. You will be a beautiful bride someday, and the lucky person who gets to call you wifey will be the lucky one. Ah, that's so cringe. <laughs> So uh I, I want to tell you a little side note. Um when I when I was living in California, I worked for I, I won't say the name of the company, but I worked for a, a printing company for like six years and we printed everything you can imagine you can print. But you know, we're as open to the public. So people would like put up their like their zines and like their their own personal like books that they were making. And I cannot remember the name of the girl. Um, and I don't think I would say it anyway, but she was a female like power lifter or bodybuilder or something like this but she's on instagram and she got these kind of comments like all the time and yeah. she uh she blocked out all of the names of the accounts but she made a whole book of it like a picture book of like 
like a post that she made and then all the comments was like every other page and it was just pure gold it was amazing because it's the oh, same yeah, thing yeah. like you know, re- just reading through it, you're just like people are really this awful <laughs> like dude I'll, I'll, like, I'll, I'll tell you a story and I, I don't know whether i've ever said this on the podcast before but so i i used to date a girl that had a uh, that had an only fans and um she didn't do anything beyond that but right. uh, she, had a, she had she had an only fans and she yeah. um you know made a fucking decent amount of money out of it but the messages that she showed me were the most fucking insane things I've ever seen in my entire life. There was one message where somebody wrote to her at length, and we're talking like nine or 10 paragraphs, of the dream that he has to be shrunk down to the size of an ant and live inside of her vagina. <laughs> so- Seems damp. Seems very damp. And he was, and he was 100% <laughs> serious about it. Another guy... Uh, wrote to her and offered to have her basically berate him and call him an asshole for um, what's him, I don't know, half an hour or whatever on, on cam. Yeah, and yeah. he was going to pay her 3000 pounds to do so. And so she, she looked into who it was because originally I, I said to her, Oh, well, it must be some, you know, lunatic stockbroker or something. Who's just, he's got so much money. He doesn't know what to do with it. Right. She looked into it and the guy was a fucking delivery driver. That was like his Christmas bonus that could have gone to his family, and he's oh, wow. such a freak that that his his uh, his big dream of how he's going to spend that money is uh, like get 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 on get on cam and call me an asshole. <laughs> yeah, I don't get it, man. Like you know, I mean, I I like sex as much as the next guy, but I, I don't know like how it gets to that point where you just like lose your mind. Like I, I knew this girl in California; she had OnlyFans as well, and uh, she had a side hustle where she would send her socks and like her like panties and stuff to dudes who would pay like the right price. And dude, what she about made, that woman? She made that dude thousands, thousands yeah, yeah. of dollars. What about, what about Belle Delphine sending her bath water to people? Oh yeah. Right. Yeah, she, she, she packaged, I think, was it, I, and I speak under correction here, but she packaged something like 30,000 vials of bath water and they sold out inside of something like 72 hours. Well, I think and then something the worst worse. thing is, there were oh, people ahead. that that were getting sick because they were drinking. The water. Of course, of course. <laughs> I'll tell you another thing too, which is like a, an unspoken thing. Maybe some people speak about, it, but I'll tell you another thing about that Belle Delphine and like other girls like her and stuff like that. Like, like no one, no one talks about, but she's obviously playing a little girl, right? So this is like on some level, this yeah, is yeah, like yeah. playing agree. off of people's like pedophilia fantasies and stuff like that. And that's yeah. not me being like some weird guy, like. Like, I mean, that's, that's exactly what it is. Like, you yeah. know, I'm not trying to censor her. She's like, good, good, you know, good for her. Go for it. But <laughs> yeah. if you, if you watch, uh, if you're listening to this too, I'll say this again. If you're watching Belle Delphine and you're jerking off to her, we know what you're doing. And you need yeah, to I was stop about to it. say, stop it, boy. You, stop you it. You scumbag. <laughs> that's what, that's what you are. You, you stop it you right scumbag. now. <laughs> no, I, 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 t- I totally agree with you. Uh, you know, more power to her. She's, she's taking, uh, She's taking advantage of, of of guys being fucking morons, and if I were a woman, I would for sure do that as well. Hundred percent. Yeah, I'd I would. I wouldn't do it. Oh, man, if I if I were an attractive woman, I wouldn't work a day in my life because <laughs> no, all no. I would have is like, all right, who who who's up for it, guys? Thirty thousand dollars for the first person to get on camera so I can call them a dickhead. Dude, if I could sell my stinky ass socks for two grand, like I would totally do it. But yeah. no one's buying my stinky fucking socks. Like, yeah. No. Um, <laughs> Okay, so nothing, nothing much else on yeah. One, one thing that's um, uh, I don't want to bring the tone down, but uh, Judas Priest update on Richie Faulkner's health status. Yeah, that was crazy. That was crazy, yeah. man. So a, 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 an aortic aneurysm and a yeah, complete aortic heart. dissection yeah, yeah. during a live performance. Uh, Judas Priest guitarist Richie Faulkner has now checked in with an update. His full statement can be read below. Let's see what he has to say. Okay, yeah, let's check this out. Today, just being able to type this to all of you is the biggest gift of all. As I watch the footage from the Louder Than Life Festival in Kentucky, I can see in my face the confusion and anguish I was feeling while playing Painkiller, which, I mean, that might be the most insane thing of all. Like, he's playing that song of all the I know, songs. right? Yeah. As my aorta ruptured and started to spill blood into my chest cavity. Jesus. Man. I was ha- uh, I was having what my doctor called an aortic aneurysm and complete aortic dissection. From what I've been told by my surgeon, people with this don't usually make it to the hospital alive. I was taken to nearby right heart and lung center and quickly went into what turned out to be a 10 and a half hour emergency open heart surgery. Man. Fuck. Jesus Christ, that's crazy. Um, I mean, 
I'm, you know, it's so awesome that, that he's alive, you know, not just for his sake, but for his family's sake as well. I mean, but I would say just to bring some levity to it, like if you if you kick it on stage with Judas Priest, I mean, that's a pretty rad way to I was about know, to say to tap like you know interesting but, thing that he says uh, yeah one last thing uh maniacs this came totally out of the blue for me no history of a bad heart no clogged arteries my point is i don't even have high cholesterol and this could have been the end for me if you can get yourselves checked do it for me please lots of love and uh see you down the front again soon yeah, um man. mental Good luck uh, mental all right let's move over to the democrats guide to rock music oh this uh, is gonna be fun. there is there is a story i saw this morning because it popped up on my google news feed okay uh that i i i'd have to jump into straight away okay uh this one what a <laughs> fucking absolute idiot this man continues to be so the headline to those of you who are listening uh tom morello on january 6th attack in the u on the u.s capitol we came to within a baby's breath of a fascist coup in this country. I am, I'm so gobsmacked by the fact that anybody could say that and actually believe it. Because I, I, I think it, there's only two things that could get you to, to that point. Is one, either you're completely ignorant of how the government in America works. There are three legis- three branches of government: the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary. Ju- right. Judiciary, yeah. and you don't automatically gain control over all three just because you're in the capital and it's like I've got your base. I run the country now. So that's also, fucking mental. I want to bring this up really quick. Have you ever seen uh, "Sleep Now in the Fire" music video? Oh yes. Well, so yeah, yeah. This was. If you read the, the, the full statement, yes, the whole, this is the insanity of this, right? Okay. So in a new interview with renowned bullshit Bible, The Guardian, uh, Rage Against the Machine guitarist Tom Morello was asked how he felt about the January 6th attack on the US Capitol. He responded, we came to within a baby's breath of a fascist coup in this country. Interestingly, one of my dreams has always been to storm the Capitol, but not with a bunch of all white right wing terrorists, you know. Yeah. So so he's he's talking. Firstly, the, the first sentence is just complete and utter nonsense. And like I said, anybody who knows even the slightest bit about a government knows that a, a, a bunch of drunk morons and fucking idiots dressed like cartoon characters don't automatically control the government because they're sitting at Nancy Pelosi's desk. No, it doesn't work like that. No. So 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 that's one. Even if you want to extrapolate that further and go, oh, well, you know, Trump could have, uh, you know, joined them and then, then then run things from there. How would he have done so without support of the government right. and a, a support of significant portions of uh, what's name, uh, of the military? It, right. it would never have happened. So yeah. shut the fuck up, you moron. Supposedly, by the way, Harvard, Harvard educated scholar, which is which is what I've had thrown at me back when I could still be asked to uh, have conversations with people online. But they stormed. I don't know. I can't remember what building it was. It wasn't Library of Congress, but it was like one of those big buildings down there in DC. They stormed that for that music video for the sole purpose of making a music video, incited a riot. Were all arrested as a result of like making that music. Video. Well, they were wrongfully arrested because they're on the oh, right, right side. Right, of they're history. on the right side of things. Right, <laughs> yeah. Zach, Zach Delaroca and Tom Morello. Were like I was about to say on the right side of things, but so it goes on. The ugliest part about it is how they've co-opted the idea of standing against the man. Because, because all the suspicious shit coming from the, the, the Democrat side and from the left, like, you know, I don't know, burying the Hunter Biden story right before the election because that could hurt the election. The fact that no one in, in ma- mainstream media still addresses the fact that Hunter Biden uh, has used the N-word repeatedly on, on personal emails to people, is a scumbag, a drug addict, all the stuff going on in, in uh, Kamala Harris's uh, back garden and in, and in Joe Biden's back garden, all of that stuff completely suppressed by the media but the idea of standing against the man is wrong if it's not if it's not done by the by the left if it's not done by my way yeah exactly and then and then the next one there can be no nuanced thinking like yes big pharma is horrible but getting a vaccine to save your grandma is good but equally we're not even allowed to question what's in the what's in the vaccine we're not even allowed to, to to look at the Project Veritas videos that have come out recently where people from Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer are saying there's a bunch of bullshit in this vaccine and your antibodies are a lot better for you. We're not even allowed to we're not even allowed to question it. Well, I mean, you know, the anarchist view, I mean, if you're a true punk rocker, you know, if you go off of like bands like Crass and stuff like that, is that all all government's bad, you know, so. Yeah. You can't side with one or the other because they're all corrupt. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, yeah, so it's but this is this is a, this this is going to be this my is better. This, this guy's better. Than, that, no, no, I agree. <laughs> but this has been my point for a while, though. This is how you know these people are full of shit. Is the yeah. fact that 
they they will t- speak out against one side but never the other and they they sp- the, the way that they speak out is almost just straight parroting of whatever fucking rubbish they've picked up on you know Don Lemon Chris Cuomo uh Rachel Maddow all the stupid newspapers they read the New York Times the failing New York Times the Guardian all of what's those sorts saying, of stuff what's he saying down here too i want to what what's this thing about uh, Woody Guthrie and Bruce Springsteen. What's that all about? Oh, yeah. So first of all, there's no accounting for stupidity, Tom said. There's a long list of radical left anthems that are misunderstood by bozos who sing them at events like that. From Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land to Bruce Springsteen's Born in the USA to John Lennon's Imagine. And then the best thing, yeah, is you can either put a beat to a Noam Chomsky lecture. No one wants that but there's going to be no mistaking what the content is, or you can make music that's compelling. Noam Chomsky is another guy who is held up by folks on the Morello side of the, uh, of the aisle as this great intellectual. He's a fucking linguistics professor who then somehow decided, I know everything there is to know about everything else in the world, politics, geopolitics, the economy, everything else, and everyone should listen to me. He's a fucking fool. It's no different. Like listening, paying any attention to that guy on the on the economy and on things like socialism and stuff like that is, is literally no different to a drummer trying to lecture a guitarist on how to play when the drummer has never ever played the guitar in his life. Well, John Lennon too. I mean, I, I'm not going to be smirched the good name of the Beatles, but John Lennon as a person, like he was a well-known asshole. Like he yeah. was a, a real piece of shit kind of guy. Like yeah, no yeah. one liked being around him. I mean, you could say some of that had something to do with the fact that he was a heroin addict for a while, but he was a really known asshole. Like he, real piece of shit. You know, <laughs> he might have gotten his, his act together when he wrote Imagine, but I mean, to, to make that like your your uh, like one of your your you know figureheads. Uh, it's a how how story. insane was it, by the way, that. Um, uh, what's his face that uh, that Imagine song that that I think it was um, Gail G- Gal Gadot whatever her name is. Oh yeah, Gal Gadot. The the why woman? in a million years when Granny is dying would you would you sing a song? Imagine there's no heaven. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh man, like, that's insane. Yeah. Imagine there's no heaven when Granny's dead. She's gone forever. Well, this this song keeps popping up too because didn't they do this? Didn't they do this song like uh back like during like Trump era like where all the celebrities were like in black and white and they were all like cameoing themselves in like a music video where they were singing like, there's loads of stuff like that there's also yeah, that yeah. very infamous i apologize video which was right. it was like that it was just like that ever. but they did imagine instead but it was like you know if you went into yeah, that, the, if you went into the dirt of all the people that were actually singing that song <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. it's just like oh man you got the best of the best didn't you <laughs> Uh, it's it's like I said, Tom, I mean, and Tom Morello, by the way, he's held up as one of the the great intellectuals in the music uh, world, and you know everything he says, he's really switched on, blah blah blah. He's a he like all the people that 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 parrot the same old bullshit like him is a fucking imbecile. Uh, I'm not a fan. Last thing last thing I liked of his was Battle of L.A. by Rage Against the Machine. I haven't liked anything he's done ever since then. I, I like the first two Rage Against the Machine albums, but beyond yeah. that, everything is abysmal. Uh, here's one guy I do like, Fozzie's Christian. Oh, the champion. Le champion. <laughs> I wish he. I wish he would go heel again, though. I don't. I. I don't like face Jericho. Um, yeah, but he but, goes back and forth, though. He. he yeah. he'll, he'll probably go back again. Hopefully, but Le, 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 I. I. I think. I mean, I followed his career all of his life, but I. I think Le Champion was the greatest. That was so um, fucking. It, it was. He, it like was that, that whole Matt Hart, uh, the Hardy, and the Jericho thing, like back and forth, was just hilarious. Man. Oh, that that was, was, it was. So, it was. It was. <laughs> Um, and I like his I like his podcast as well. He recently did one on uh, Woodstock '99 as well, where he had one of the security guys from uh, from the event. Um, and uh, yeah, that dude had some pretty interesting stories to tell. Okay, yeah, um, yeah. but yeah, he, great, great dude. Uh, not so great dude, Co- Corey Nostril Taylor. Oh God, he really does look awful after COVID. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, oh, he's look he's looked awful for a oh, while. Oh, that's a, no, that's a mask. Sorry, sorry, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> uh, stains Aaron Lewis rails against man created oh, virus we blames the Democrats for every guy. scar that exists in this country. Um, this see, this is the problem with the right too. Like this is this is the same thing just happening on the other side of the spectrum. Like this Aaron Taylor needs, or Aaron Lewis needs to just shut his mouth too. Man. Yeah, like, no, I I I I agree. I agree. 
I'll tell you something uh, that I was very surprised about. Uh, uh, Terence is, I don't know if he's a Republican voter, but he's, he's for sure not a fan of the current administration. Who's that? Uh, Terence from Suffocation. Oh, 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 okay. Steve Stevens, why Lars Ulrich is a great drummer. Kelly and I spoke about this at length. Uh, Kelly Schaefer, he's a man. oh yeah, he's the fucking greatest guitar player who played for Billy Idol. Like yeah, yeah. oh my god, I can't wait to hear this guy's opinion on who's Lars. the best drummer. I, in fact, okay, let's 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 deep dive. Let's um, do it. <laughs> so sometimes people say, well, Lars Ulrich is not the most technical drummer, but the thing is, great drummers write great parts. There's two ways to go. You can concentrate on the technical ability and keep a straight beat or whatever. But then there's a guy like Lars, who really obviously is a co-writer, but he's really listening to what James is doing. And he's translating those guitar parts to the drums and orchestrating them. And I it's think James, what, it's James's fault that he plays drums like shit. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And I think that's what makes a great drummer because some of those drum parts, they're really inventive. What the fuck is inventive about? Or, or this one right here. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. That's literally the most inventive he ever got. That's probably the, the most inventive he's ever done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I happen to think, I mean, you know, Steve Stevens can think what he wants, but uh I I for, for me the debate was settled. That remember the the download show where Lars was um uh I don't know, caught up with some groupies or something. Something delayed him from getting there and uh he didn't make the plane and they had a bunch of other drummers doing it. They had Joey Jordison. Uh, they yeah, had yeah, yeah. Dave Lombardo. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That that yeah. settled it for me because all of those songs, when you listen to them, they all sound better without Lars. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you could have Lombardo drumming, fuck. Yeah, I mean, man. Lars has made enough money. Maybe you could just kind of sign on as a consultant for the band. Lars, right? Lars you know, he cemented himself a long time ago in in uh, in being unable to be removed from Metallica. So yeah we're, we're stuck with him whether we like it or not but uh yeah unfortunately uh not the best not the best behemoth announces uh x x x years of uh blasphemy uh, uh, they were they were dying they were dying to use that like x x x weren't they they were oh, so yeah. happy when they uh, oh here we go here we go okay here Pomerello we go defense his friendship with dead legend <laughs> <laughs> okay so yeah, deep dive this too. Deep dive this. Come I on. reserve but, the right to be friends with anybody. I will say what? this in, in defense of, of the Nuge. That, talking about, that, talking that, about rant that, he, that rant that he goes on about veganism, though, on uh, Joe Rogan, that, that's a very like famous viral rant. I do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. But talk um, about bozos. He was talking like Morello was just talking about bozos who sing along to Imagine and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, like, no, I agree. Hey, fucking Ted Nugent. Come on. Come on. So man. it says, yeah. <laughs> Morello, who's a member of one of the most militant left-wing rap rock metal bands of all time. Not metal. Take that back. Well, you, 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 you slow your roll on that. You slow your roll, yeah. Discussed you, his unlikely relationship with the outspoken conservative rocker during a recent interview with NME. He said, I reserve the right to be friends with anybody. I reserve the right to confront opinions I disagree with, with open-heartedness and love, or by throwing a brick. That, you wouldn't throw a brick around the Nuja's house, though, because you'd get a uh, you'd get an arrow in the anus. Right. That's up to me. In the in the case of Ted, I know he's become this right wing caricature, but there have been several times when I've reached out to him on issues that you might be surprised about. But he still is crazy Uncle Ted, who says all sorts of shit. This is exactly what I was talking about when I said that they don't like it when they can't have it their way. You know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So. It's all good in the hood for Tom Morello to be friends with Ted Nugent and also shit down you like on whatever like stance you you hold. But yeah. as soon as soon as it gets back to like oh what but no 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 what Ted Nugent's cool because he's my friend. You can't he's listen my, to his my music. Homie. Yeah, yeah. But he's well, my I mean, yeah. In 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 Morello's defense, there at least he's not like uh, he's not like some of the folks in Hollywood who take that to new extremes. Like you remember when. Um, when it turned out that, that Chris Pratt was a Republican and they were like, I want him kicked off Guardians of the Galaxy. I refuse to work with him. He's right, a scumbag. Right. It's like he's had for this last several years a scandal-free career. He's well known as one of the nicest guys in the in, in the industry. And now all of a sudden, because you you yeah, he doesn't he doesn't vote for my team, he's scum of the earth. It's like right. well, Disney, Disney did that with Scarjo too. Like, you know, as soon as she as soon as she got up and on, you know you know left this hollywood's like you know uh, they're they're pretty much like the loudest microphone for like women's rights right now yeah. and then as soon as scarjo was like no disney's fucking me and they're not giving me like they they're they're taking more money and like i didn't sign this in my contract i didn't sign up for this streaming stuff this movie was supposed to go to theaters 
and like and and then they're like oh sorry well you're fucked because this is what we're doing well well, well can you imagine the irony of of what they did to gina carano because so you 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 the loudest voice for women right women's rights so you try to torpedo the career of one of, in my view, one of the strongest women, female role models that that young girls have that are, you know, famous, Gina Carano, right. because she says that she doesn't agree with your theories on gender fluidity. I mean, that to me is just, right. it's kind of the ultimate irony, I, I, I think, a lot of that, or how far a lot of that has been taken. It's like right. well, feminism got so far and you know men decided you know men in the the royal sense of the word you know the group decided well we can't take them head on so let's just work out let's just work out a tr- way to infiltrate the camp right, destroy right. from within right right <laughs> anyway okay, and, that, and that ties all the way back to you know let's censor suicidal tendencies on Instagram. there you go full circle right, right. brother uh we'll sign off uh, on this episode together so that's going to be episode 100 in the bank I'm back next week, homies with uh, Terence Hobbs of um, uh, Suffocation. Uh, and trust me, if you are even remotely a fan of Suffocation, you're going to love the conversation. If you're a fan of a great conversation with a fucking badass dude, uh, it, it was it's so much fun. I um, uh, don't know what else is coming up next week. I'll, I'll, I'll play that as I see it. Um, but uh, again, I want to say thanks to everybody for, uh, for 100 episodes of uh, undying support. Um, and uh, I am looking forward to doing another 100 of these. So, Evan, thanks very much for being part of episode 100 with me. I really appreciate it, brother. And we'll do, a, we'll do another episode again at some point soon. Yeah, right? it's, uh, when, when I get this uh, Quell stuff done, I'll, I'll be so happy to jump back on and talk about yeah. that and do another one for sure, man. And thank well, you we so don't have much to wait for, for any releases either. I mean, you know, I, I, it's always just fun to, to, to bullshit and record it. Yeah, um, yeah, you know, no, I try, absolutely. I try and actually steer away from kind of when people release us, and not you now specifically, but when yeah, bigger yeah. bands release stuff, because part of the reason I, I try and do that is because then they're in the, the interview cycle and you're actually and they're not going to get the, the, the best conversation out of them because they're so used to the same old questions. Right, right. Um, which is also sometimes tricky, like when, you, when you're trying to pitch the idea to somebody, they're like, oh, well, I don't have anything coming out now. It's like, well, I don't give a fuck. I don't necessarily I want, want to want talk about on, what you have coming on. I want to, I want to talk about other stuff. But anyway, um, I'm but thank you. I just want to say too, thank you so much for having me on. This is an honor. I mean, I'm so happy for you. I can't, words cannot express like how happy I've watched you grow from like the first all the way up to here. And like, dude, this is just amazing. So happy for you. And uh, yeah, I wish you nothing but the best of luck from here on out, man. Thank you, brother. And, and I'll, I'll say this as well. You know, when I mentioned about becoming friends, it's an absolute pleasure and a pleasure and a privilege to call you a friend, mate. So, and hopefully we get to uh, see each other in person at some point in the next uh, next 12 months. So, I hope uh, so. Uh, we when should. we do that, we'll, 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 we'll get the recording set up as well. We'll do, we'll do one in person. Yeah, let's do that. That'll be open. great. Have you, you hear sizzling in the background. That'll be uh. me <laughs> hurting the vegans and uh, <laughs> stabbing Thomas Warrior in the eyes, <laughs> proverbially speaking. Anyways, uh, I'm going to play out with a uh, the most fitting track I could select for this uh, for this show. Uh, this is off of Ad Majorum Satanas Glorium. Uh, it is Gorgoroth with my favorite Gorgoroth track, a song called Exit. See you motherfuckers next week. Mm-hmm.